Uh, so we're continuing on in our Stoop Talk series. Uh, Y'all have been incredibly gracious uh, and walking with us as we try something new. Amen. Uh, we're grateful for God uh, giving us uh, this idea and the kind of imagination to to plant ourselves firmly uh, in Brooklyn and to, to call on the cultural genius of Brother Spike Lee, amen, and to set that alongside uh, God's word and to see what God uh, has to speak to us uh, each and every week. And so y'all uh, pray with us and God met us while we did doing the right thing. Uh, Y'all uh, prayed with us, and we know show sure enough, show sure enough God met us when Pastor Gabby preached on musings on risk-taking and truth-telling uh, through the prism of She's Gotta Have It. Uh, if you were blessed by that message, won't you just say amen? Amen, amen. And uh, we're believing that God is going to show up once more as we're here on the stoop. Uh, moving through uh, yet another classic, iconic work in uh, Brother Shelton Spike Lee's uh, corpus. Uh, and even more critically, we're going to uh, anchor that within scripture. Uh, so we're going to be talking through Crooklyn, uh, set against uh, Proverbs chapter 17, verse 17. Won't you turn there with me now as we go to God's word. Amen. I'm, uh, even though I'm on the stoop, I'm going to stand on the stoop to, to read the scriptures, if that's all right. I, it just feels fitting to, uh, to step. Maybe I'm not going to stand on the stoop because we, we, we got the, uh, the alignment set up in a certain way. I'm going to stand in my spirit on the stoop. Bless the Lord. Because uh, 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 Rosa Parks told us that you can stand up even while you're sitting down. You'll get that on the way home. Amen. Uh, it reads as follows. Uh, the text says, a friend, I'm reading from the New of our Standard Version. A friend loves at all times, and kinsfolk are born to share adversity. It's just one verse that we're working with for today. It says, a friend loves at all times. Somebody say all times. And kinsfolk, uh, by which we mean family, are born to share adversity. Let's pray as we get ready to move into God's word. Good and gracious God, we thank you for being the source of every good and perfect gift, which means, God, that you are the point of origin for this thing we call preaching. Show up, God. Have your way. Let us be hearers of your word, and by the power of your spirit, help us to take the next step, the transformative step, and to be doers of your word to the glory of your son, Jesus Christ, and to the betterment of our lives in Jesus Christ, we pray. Somebody say amen. Amen. So we're going to be preaching from Proverbs chapter 17, verse 17. And the theme that we're going to be working with is friendship and kinship during hard times. I'm going to say that one more time. Friendship and kinship during hard times. Uh, we're going to be working through uh, the movie Crooklyn as a sermonic aid for us this morning, uh, this evening. Uh, the high calling of kinship and friendship is to provide soul care, uh, to provide that kind of emotional labor that helps us to pull through and push through hard times. Uh, and, and, and the high and related calling of, of kinfolk, uh, of family, uh, is to help uh, administer and to uphold life's burdens together. Uh, let me see if I can pull that together. The high calling of friendship and kinship is to provide soul care and to bear one another's burdens during hard times. That, that, that's the thesis, that's the sermon in the sentence. The, the, the great and high calling of people who are your genuine friends and folks who don't only share your last name, don't only come to the family reunion, but whose purpose uh, and intention is to be with you in the hard times. Our high calling uh, is to share one another's burdens and to provide soul care. Uh, how many folks know that uh, what makes friendship uh, the genuine article, what makes family uh, such a precious portion in our lives, is not so much that uh, we like the same things. 
Uh, it's not so much that we share the same pastimes. If, can, can we just talk on the stoop? Uh, it's not so much that uh, we happen to uh, live under the same roof or live in the same state. It's a wonderful thing to be next to your, your, your cousins and your aunties and your uncles and uh, your friends to have them in your same apartment or uh, in your same borough. That's a beautiful thing. But, but at the end of the day, what makes us thank God and be grateful for friends and for family is if they can administer a pain that no hospital can supply when you're going through a hard time. Are, are you with me? Uh, the, the songwriter said, I've had some good days and I've had some hills to climb. I've had some weary days uh, and I've also had some sleepless nights. And we thank God for friends and family that are with us through the good days. Amen. Uh, but if you really want to have friends and family that you can count on, they need to also be with you when you have hills to climb. They need to also be with you when you have weary days. Amen. And they also have to travel alongside you when you have uh, sleepless nights and lonely episodes and seasons of your life. And what I love about Crooklyn in Spike Lee's body of work is that he portrays a beautiful black family in Brownstone, Bedford, Stuyvesant, Brooklyn, pre-gentrification, y'all with me? Post-civil rights. And he shows this family trying to do exactly what our text talks about, trying to love one another at all times, even when they have hills to climb, even when they have weary days and sleepless nights. Spike Lee is trying to show us in Crooklyn what it looks like to be uh, a family during the adverse and difficult and tumultuous seasons of life. And what makes the film poignant is that their family, not unlike all of our families, sometimes they get it right and sometimes it's, it's not quite so right. Amen. Uh, Y'all don't leave me out there like I'm talking uh, about a reality you have no experience with. The beautiful thing about Crooklyn is that it captures the highs and the lows, the, the resonant and the unpleasant. Crooklyn shows us what it means to go through uh, the peaks and the low periods and seasons of life. And for many of us, the question that we have when we go through these periods and these low seasons of life is how are we going to find the strength? How are we going to find uh, the, the sucker? How are we going to find uh, the serenity that we need to pull through those moments? Let me tell you a little bit more about the story. So Crooklyn not only depicts the life of this family, but it tells the story of this jazz father named Woody. Uh, he's a musician. And it also tells the story of uh, a teacher and dynamic community leader and mother named Carolyn. Uh, and it talks about uh, the, the, the their struggles to, uh, uh, to do what uh, Reverend Al Green uh, called, let's stay together. Amen. Uh, and in narrating this story, it's all told from a particular point of view. It's told from the point of view of a beautiful black girl child named Troy. Uh, and so as we enter into Spike Lee's plot line and story, we have to see things through the eyes of, of, of Troy. And what, what Troy helps us to understand is that when we see the loss and when we see the strain and these, these void seasons of life, uh, it helps us to understand that uh, we sometimes have to grit our teeth and, and go through those difficult and troubling seasons alone. And, and, and when we get through those moments, uh, a part of what I think is, is powerful is that this text helps us to see uh, a few ways that we can all lean into a deeper kind of friendship and a deeper kind of kinship. Uh, and with your permission, I just want to walk through a few of those ways while I'm here on the stoop. Uh, I don't mean nobody, no harm, but I just want to walk through what it means to exemplify true friendship and true kinship while we're here on the stoop. Because a part of what Crooklyn uh, comes to show us is that every family not only goes through loss generally, uh, but we go through particular and, and hard scrabble seasons of loss. Crooklyn begins to come into focus when one particular episode happens. When uh, the mother named Carolyn dies, Troy and Woody and all the rest of the children, their life starts to descend into a tailspin. 
And for many of us, when we go through uh, death-like experiences and voids, it can become difficult for us not only to press our way on in the Christian journey, but it can become difficult for us to sense and to see the hand of God in our lives when we go through a void and through a dark and difficult season of life. Can I talk about where we are in the country for a moment? This week, we lost two of the most steadfast stalwart warriors in this justice work. Uh, in fact, three of them. We not only lost uh, C.T. Vivian and uh, Reverend C.T. Vivian, we not only lost Congressman John Lewis, uh, but we also lost uh, Sister Emma Sanders, who was a part of uh, the justice work with the Mississippi uh, Democratic Party in the 60s. And so these three uh, constellations of courage and justice, we lost them. Uh, and it's a difficult moment to come to grips with those who we love, not only in the spotlight, but in our personal and more intimate uh, lights of life. When we lose them, it can be difficult to call on God like we used to. It can be difficult to call on the rhythms and the routines of our faith when we experience loss. And so Crooklyn gives us a kind of tableau and backdrop for coming to terms with what it means to move through laws and to pull on our friends and to pull on our kins when God seems distant. And so here's the first point that I want to share. When God seems distant and when that void of life makes uh, the, the sunshine on a cloudy day run far away from us, the, the first thing that we have to do is to rely on friends and kins to bring the nearness of God to us when God feels absent and distant. Relying on friends and kins to embody and to enflesh God's presence to us when we would otherwise have a difficult time lifting up our hands and praise and worship and connecting with God is the first step while we're talking on the stoop to get close to God in the void. Uh, friends and kin have a way of of, of escorting us to the presence of God when we're at uh, our, our, our life's edge and sometimes we're beginning to, to tip over. I hope y'all don't mind if I, if I talk about this thing for a little bit. Uh, let me share with you a story that I think captures uh, the situation and the circumstance. Uh, earlier uh, this week, uh, Pastor Gabby and I were watching a video, uh, a documentary really, that tells the story of uh, of John Lewis. It's called Good Trouble. Uh, how many of y'all have seen that, that, that documentary, Good, Good, Good Trouble, that kind of narrates the story of his life? Um, it's, it's, it's ready and available to be watched if, if the saints haven't seen it. Uh, but there's a powerful story uh, in there that uh, captures how friends and family can connect us to God when we might otherwise drown in the void and in the vicissitudes of life. There's a story that's told when John Lewis' chief of staff named Michael, who'd been with John Lewis for 20 years. Somebody say 20 years. He had been with him for 20 years, uh, and John Lewis, who had been fighting for voting rights from 20 all the way up to 50, 60, and on up to uh, uh, the day that he had passed, uh, the story is told that his chief of staff for 20 years was with John Lewis when the Voting Rights Act, that uh, principle and legacy piece of legislation that John Lewis fought his whole career to see passed and to see re reintroduced. Y'all with me? The, on the day when the Voting Rights Act was to be reauthorized, so it would stay into effect, Michael, who had been with John Lewis for 20 years, his father died, and there was a funeral. And so Michael Lewis's chief of staff went to the funeral, uh, and when Michael was narrating this story, he told us that when he got to the funeral, uh, expecting to be perhaps only with his friends and his loved ones, he also came to find a different companion was there with him as well. And it turned out to be that Congressman John Lewis chose to be with his chief of staff, uh, who also was his friend for 20 years. He chose to show up at the funeral, y'all, rather than to be present at Congress when the Voting Rights Act was to be reauthorized. And so the, the, the test and the proving 
of friends are, will they provide the kind of comfort that you're looking for even when it's inconvenient? Will, will friends provide the kind of support and love and a pull through accompaniment that you need when you can't get your own prayer through, but you need somebody else to walk beside you? The, the test of friends and family is will they be by your side, not only in a text message, not only in I'm going to pray for you and I'll send praying hands, but will they show up in the flesh and be hope when you don't have hope for yourself and be love when you have a hard time loving yourself. The acid test of friends who, as this proverb says, love at all times and are the kind of kinsfolk that are born to share adversity is will you traverse alongside me when I go through trouble? This is the kind of love that we see uh, exemplified in our text. It reminds me of the kind of love that 1 Corinthians calls us to when it says that not only uh, if we can paraphrase that scripture, are we called to rejoice with those who rejoice, uh, but friendship that you can depend on also leans on that last clause, which means we're called to mourn with those who mourn. And I just want to talk to somebody who's gone through or who may be going through some difficult seasons of your life. You need you some friends that you can depend on when the bottom falls out of life. When life is difficult and troublesome for you, you need some friends that you can count on and depend on. Amen. And not only is it important for us to have friends that we can count on and depend on, but the inverse is also true. And the self-examination is also required. Are we the kind of friends that folks can depend on in the midst of adversity? Are we the kind of companions who are reliable, who are dependable when folks go through hard times? When one of your friends goes to the hospital, let me see if I can make it plain. Are you the one who sends the Hallmark card, who, who stops by in person, or, or, or do you take a, a safe distance and just drop a little comment on their social media timeline? When, when, when your friends need to pull on you for the deep, and demanding measure of compassionship, are we there to be found? That's the first lesson that uh, Crooklyn comes to teach us during this season of loss and that the proverb comes right behind us and wants us to understand. When we're going through the void and when God seems distant, we need friends and kin to help pull us close to God when it seems like God has pulled away from us. But let's keep journeying further in our explorations together. Uh, when you have moments where you're going through the ringer of life and trouble seems like it's going to last always, we not only need friends and kins to pull us close to God, uh, but we also need to trust on a different kind of family in order to help us to get to the God of our salvation and the God of our strength. And that different kind of family that I'm talking about is our black church family. Are you with me this evening? Our black church family has surrounded the individual families when we didn't have the resources to take care of ourselves. Sometimes we would just depend on the resources of our black church family. Our black church family in particular, the point I want to draw on, supplies theological resources to help us to call on God and to invoke the presence of the divine when we're going through a difficult moment and a difficult season. I tell you, when I was watching Crooklyn, it hit me deeply because when Carolyn dies, you see Troy trying to come to grips with what is one of the most unavoidable and difficult aspects of life, and that is the fact of death. You can't praise your way out of the hurt of death. You can't sing your way out of the hurt of death. You can't airbrush your way out of the sting of somebody you love transitioning to glory by way of the graveyard. When somebody you know and care about goes six feet under before they're raised subsequently to glory, it creates a hollow region on the inside of you. And it's in that moment where we see Troy filled with promise and yet 
hurting and, uh, uh, and hungry for a sense of meaning when life imposes this difficult burden on her. Uh, it makes us wonder what kind of resources do we have to help us cope when life uh, deals us that kind of deaf experience with that deaf-like uh, situation that's hard for us to deal with. And one of the things I want to call up before us this morning is that the theological resources of our black church family can help us uh, to put a psychologically healthy praise on our pain. Are you with me? I'm talking about songs like, Sometimes I Feel Like a Motherless Child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child a long, long way from home. Those are the kinds of theological resources that our black church family has given to us so that we can put, are you with me, a psychologically healthy praise on the top of our pain. Because every praise that we put on top of our pain is not psychologically healthy. Oh, Y'all don't want to talk with me when we're on the stoop. Uh, we, if we can't be candid on the stoop, where can we be candid? If we can't tell the truth about making sure that our faith helps us to keep ourselves together rather than having our faith serve as a destructive escape hatch when we're moving through the agonies of life, then, then we ain't really come to sit on the stoop. But, but we came to sit on the stoop, and since we're here on the stoop, we might as well talk real. Amen. Uh, let, let me share with you another one of the theological resources that have been a blessing to me uh, as I've dealt with those void-like experiences and the death of loved ones. I, I think about uh, the great late Thomas Dorsey song, Precious Lord, Take My Hand, Lead Me On and Help Me Stand. I am weak. Does anybody know the song I'm talking about? I am worn through the storm, through the night. Lead me on into the light. Precious Lord, take my hand and lead me on. Th th this experience of calling on a Lord who is not only our authority, but a Lord who is authoritative and gentle enough to be called a precious Lord. This is the God who, who, who not only uh, says that everything will be all right, but this is the precious Lord who takes us by the hand and leads us on and helps us to stand when uh, anxiety might otherwise make you not want to stand, when, when sorrow and tears might otherwise not make you want to stand. We serve a precious Lord who will take you by the hand and lead you through the storm lead you through the night. These are the theological resources of our black church family. The point that I'm pressing here is that when your immediate friends and your immediate kin can't help you uh, uh, vision your way through the void of life, sometimes it's taking the songs that the deacons and the church mothers and the preachers told you and, and, and the laity put on the inside of your spirit that helps you to move on. Y'all not working with me, so I'm going to call on a, a couple more songs. Uh, uh, I remember the deacon's hymn line, and uh, have you got good religion? Uh, have you got good religion? Certainly, Lord. Have you got good religion? Certainly, Lord. And just in case your determination was wavering, we say it three times. Have you got good religion? Certainly, 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 Lord. When, when you sing those songs on the inside, Father, I stretch my hand to thee. No other help I know. Does anybody uh, acquainted with the songs of Zion? If you withdraw your hand from me, whether shall I go? It is the theological resources of our black church family that help us to find our way back to a familiar space of wholeness when we feel existentially abandoned. When you feel out of home in your own body, it's knowing that the songs of our black church family can help you feel like yourself again, help you feel like living again, help you feel like 
praying again, help you feel like trying again, help you feel like interceding again, help you feel like hoping again. Y'all not talking to me. Help you feel like life is worth the living just because he lives. When you internalize and personalize the theological resources of your black church family, it becomes uh, 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 an aid and an assistant to your own survival. Let, let me give you a more contemporary example uh, that, that, that's not a, a, a hymn. It's, it's not uh, something you find in a book, but uh, it's, it's a powerful preface to a song uh, that, that, that Brother Kurt Franklin lifts up that, that I find powerful. In, in the song, I'll Be Looking For You, uh, he says, uh, to all of God's people in the struggle, here's some pain medicine. And, 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 and the idea that the songs of the church can be a pain medicine that helps soothe and comfort and console is God's uh, designed way of helping to uh, wipe away your tears and to help you make it through the storms and the suffering and the sorrow and the bitter seasons of your life. When you can't trust, or rather when you're having a hard time connecting with friends and kin, lean on the theological resources of our black church family to help you move through the void of life. Uh, uh, and, and while we're sitting here on the stoop, uh, some of you may be wondering, well, well, I've had times when uh, my family, like this proverb says, when, when they've loved me at all times. Uh, I've had times when I've sure enough known that, that my immediate family, my blood family, was, was born to shoulder that adversity. But there's also been times, uh, maybe when you were moving through adolescence, maybe when you moved out the house, or maybe when you uh, 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 got your first job, or whatever the case may be, when, when your friends and your family couldn't quite connect with you like you used to. Right? And maybe somebody else is, is saying, there have been times when I've called on the theological resources, the songs, and the stories of the black church. But Perhaps there have also been times when the songs and the stories weren't quite hidden like they used to. Uh, and, 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 and you called on them, uh, but they didn't seem to have uh, the same meaning and, and, and resonance. Uh, am I walking, as the old preachers would say, am I walking down anybody's stoop this afternoon? May, maybe you've had times when friends and kin and the resources of our black church family weren't able to do it for you. And it's in those uh, predicaments, in those places, that we have to interpret this text in the only spirit-filled, creative way that we possibly can. And that is to befriend yourself when nobody else can connect with you like you want to be connected with. When, when friends and kin uh, forsake you and when the songs of our dear Black Zion don't quite connect, you've got to learn how to be a friend who loves yourself at all times. And you got to learn how to look into the mirror and say, I was born and reborn in Christ to help shoulder the weight of my own adversity. When you look outside and nobody else can be the kind of help that you need, you have no choice but to look inside and to discover that all you've ever needed, God's hand has provided. Sometimes you look outside and you can't find any help and all you can do is look inside and to discover that the kingdom of our living God resides within you. Sometimes when you look outside and you can't discover the hope and the help and the healing that you need, you have to instead look on the inside and to discover that God can still make a way out of no way. Am I talking to anybody this evening? Sometimes you got the journey all the way back to Genesis 1. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, there wasn't anything to do but to vision your way beyond the void. There wasn't anything to do but to create your way beyond the chaos. There wasn't anything to do but to design your way in the midst of the darkness. Am I talking to anybody this evening? 
that's ever had to design your way out of darkness. I don't know if anybody still believes in me. They're counting their mistakes against me, but I still believe in myself. And according to your faith, says Jesus, it will be done unto you. I don't know if anybody still has hope for me, but I can still do what Martin King used to say and take a chisel and carve out a stone of hope from the mountain of despair. I don't know if anybody still loves me like they used to, but I can still place my hand on my heart and say I love myself. I'm fearfully, wonderfully made a little lower than the angel because I found out when I look inside myself as I sit on the stoop that he sits with me and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me that I'm his own and the joy we share as we tarry there right here on the stoop none other has ever known I tell you it's good to follow Jesus who else is the friend who loves you at all times who else is the kinsman redeemer that was born to shoulder our adversity who else is a friend above all others? I'm told that he's the firstborn of the new creation. I'm told that he's a family that gives you faith when you have unbelief. I'm told that he's a family that can help you when your mother and father forsake you. I'm told that the new household of faith can help you push through when life throws you down. I'm told that Jesus makes us kinfolk, kinfolk, so that we can all be at the cookout and be friends to one another and be siblings to one another. And even though we experience trouble like they did in Brooklyn, the same God who helped pull them through is the same God who will pull us through. And there's an old song in Crooklyn that I want to share with you. It goes one, two, three. The devil's after me. Four, five, six. He's trying to throw six. But seven, eight, nine. Seven, eight, nine. He misses every time. Somebody say the weapon is born, but it shall not prosper. Somebody say they meant it for evil but God will turn it around for good. Somebody say that all things, the good things, the hard things, the sweet things, the bitter things, the glorious things, the grotesque things, the happy things, the horrendous things, the beautiful things, the burdens of things, God works it together. God weaves it together for the good of those the Lord. So what shall we say? Who can stand against the children of the living God? If God before me. I said if God before me, it's more than a word against me. God is an army of one. God is a non-violent army of one. God will fight your battles when you're fatigued. God will be your advocate when you can't argue your case. He'll be your physician when you need healing. He'll be your help when you feel helpless. He'll be your father when you feel fatherless. He'll be your mother when you feel motherless. Ain't God all right? Ain't God all right? Ain't God all right? Ain't God all right? like shout because the Lord has brought me a mighty long way. I feel like shouting because God's been a good God. I feel like shouting because it's no secret what God can do, what he's done for my family, he'll do for you. Shout it, yeah, yeah, shout it, yeah, yeah. Mama. Mm -hmm.
Sometimes it gets good to you when you think about the goodness of our living Lord. Hallelujah. Sometimes you ought to have some exuberance. You ought not always have a dispassionate response. Sometimes you ought to have some passion about how the Prince of Peace stepped in, saved you, stepped in, raised you, stepped in, saved you. recap. Friendship and kinship during hard times. The first thing that I want to drive home is that when you go through a void, you need friends and kins to be the nearness of God when God feels distant. When the imminence and Emmanuel presence of God seems absurd, a good friend can effectively incarnate the presence of God before you. The second thing, and I'm trying to hold my peace with a little run, the second thing is that when friends and kin can't quite connect you, you can trust that the theological resources of our black church family will help you to connect with our precious Lord who will lead you on and to help you stand. But if none of those things don't work, you ought to be able to look in the city of your soul, in the solitariness of your own selfhood, and say, I know my Redeemer liveth. I know firsthand personal testimony that God is a keeper, that God is a keeper, that God is a keeper that God is a keeper hey a keeper that God is a keeper that God oh my lord is a keeper that God is a keeper he'll keep you in the valley he'll keep you when you don't want to be kept I said he'll keep you oh I feel this thing he'll keep you Listen, we don't often talk about the cognitive restructuring of Christian faith. It's true that there are some things you need medicine for, and we bless God for psychiatrists. This is not any shade to them. Get you one if you need you one. But alongside a psychiatrist, you also need to be able to apply the principles and proverbs of faith to reinterpret situations in your life. So when you get like Ezekiel and you stand in a valley of dry bones, it may look like a graveyard from a faithless perspective. But when you stand, oh my God, before a valley of dry bones from a faith-filled perspective, you can say that these dry bones can live again. Your life may look like dry bones. Relationships may look like dry bones. Your future may look like dry bones. Our democracy, Lord have mercy, may look like dry bones. Our communities may be mistaken for dry bones, but in the fullness of faith, we shall live and not die. We shall live and not die. We shall live and not die. Hallelujah. The power of life and death, also in the Proverbs, is still in the power, dear Christian, of your tongue. So we need to start redescribing some things. 
re-narrating some things, reinterpreting some things. And a good friend, good kid will help you reinterpret some things. I know you lost in that season, and it may have been a good loss, but you can win in the next season. A good friend will help you to reimagine your own reality. My God, my God, my God today.